Deep within the heart of Mexico's Huatla Plateau, a team of experienced cave explorers led by Bill Stone ventured into the unknown. Equipped with the latest technology and years of training, they were ready to overcome any obstacle that may hinder them from cracking the San Agustin stump. But as they ventured deeper into the deep, they realized they may not be able to achieve their mission as they experienced the unexpected. An inquisitive mind and the desire to explore are crucial for any great expedition. This was evident in Bill Stone's early days as a cave diver. In March 1979, he timidly crawled along the ceiling of an underwater tunnel scraping his knees against the overhead rock. Alongside his companions Hal Lloyd and Steve Zeman, known as the Kirkwood Cowboys, he ventured into the Sotano de San Agustin cave. The expedition lasted a month and a half, and upon completion, the team derigged the cave, packed their trucks, and returned home to Texas. Bill's initial dive into the San Agustin sump was a nervous one, and it earned him an article in Outside Magazine. He had been caving for several years, both in the U.S. and Mexico, but the blue abyss at the heart of Huatla was unlike anything he had ever seen. Bill believed that no one could truly know which cave is the deepest until all caves are explored. However, his fellow Kirkwood cowboys considered his dive a failure, as he had not found a route forward and concluded that the Sotano de San Agustin did not go any deeper. Despite this, Bill continuously tried to convince them otherwise, repeatedly telling them about the moment the abyss revealed itself to him. To him, it was a revelation, and he was convinced that beyond the deep sump lay the bottom of the world. But to his fellow cavers, other caves seemed more promising to explore. In 1980, explorers turned their attention to a cave called Lanita on the Huatla Plateau. After three months of exploration, they found themselves at the same place they had been the previous year, with the cave bottoming out in a sump. Bill discovered a survey station marking the cave as East Red Ball Canyon, a back alley of the Sotano de San Agustin, which connected the two caves and made it the third deepest cave on Earth. American explorers then began to refer to the interconnected caves of the Huatla Plateau as the Sistema Huatla, to make it higher on the list of deepest caves, Bill and his team planned to connect a cave called Nitananta and return to the San Agustin Sump to try and break through it. The job of organizing this expedition fell to Bill due to his expertise and previous experience. Bill, whose father was a former professional baseball player, preferred to spend his time in a basement chemistry lab rather than on the field. He completed a Ph.D. in engineering at the University of Texas while his fellow divers were working odd jobs. His interest in the San Agustin Sump led him to learn technical diving from the renowned Florida cave diver Sheck Exley. In 1981, he returned to the mountain village of San Agustin Zaragoza with his team, the Kirkwood Cowboys, Al Lloyd and Steve Zeman, and 12 high-pressure scuba tanks. He convinced his teammates to help him carry dive gear and attempted to reach deeper depths in the sump, but an unexpected storm hindered his progress. Despite this setback, he couldn't shake his fascination with the sump, and for 13 years he dreamed of returning. Eventually, he went back, but this time without the Kirkwood Cowboys, in search of a new route to the sump and found it at the base of a deep gorge called Peña Colorada or Redwall Canyon after some scouting expeditions. In 1984, Bill co-led an expedition with Bob Jeffries to explore the San Agustin sump from below. They brought a large amount of equipment, including 72 new composite fiber scuba tanks, and hired 200 men and 60 burros from the village of San Miguel Huatepec to help transport it to their base camp. Although the expedition started well, it was ultimately halted due to logistical challenges, similar to those faced in Bill's previous attempt in 1981. After discussing with his fellow divers, Noel Sloan and John Zumrich, Bill realized that using rebreathers could provide a solution to these issues. He then dedicated the next 10 years of his life to designing and constructing the most reliable rebreather ever made. However, this process was not without its difficulties. 
as he struggled to balance his roles as an inventor, politician, salesman, accountant, and mentor to a group of eccentric underwater explorers. By 1994, he was eagerly awaiting the opportunity to return to the depths of Hawatla. After long years of dedicated work in creating the rebreather, the long-awaited day finally came. On February 14, 1994, the main team gathered in Maryland. Bill Stone's team included seven main divers. First is Barbara N. Amendi. Barbara was Bill's girlfriend and the only female volunteer in the group. She had been dating Bill long distance for the past year and a half. He was separated from his wife and three young sons, but not yet divorced. Barbara had a passion for caving since she was young and had read every book her local library had about caves. She would often ask her mother to take her to one. At the age of 13, her mother took her to Makwakita Cave State Park in Iowa where Barbara went into a small opening in a cave and crawled through it, emerging covered in mud, but happy. Despite feeling embarrassed about her appearance, she was proud of her first real caving experience. Ian Rowland is a 29-year-old mechanic who works with the Royal Air Force and is a veteran of the British Cave Diving Group. He is one of the most experienced cavers on the expedition, having explored most of Europe's deep caves. He met Bill in 1985 on an experimental diving expedition at England's Wookiee Hole and was on leave from his job as a tornado jet engineer in the Royal Air Force. He is married with children and was dedicated to organizing the expedition. Noel Sloan is a 40-year-old anesthesiologist from Indianapolis who is like a brother to Bill. They were both intelligent as kids and almost lost their hands in boyhood chemistry experiments. They both took up caving in high school and went to graduate school in Texas to be near Mexican caving grounds. They became friends the moment they met outside a Florida dive shop. Kenny Broad is a 27-year-old anthropologist who is also a highly experienced diver. He grew up in Miami Beach and has a lot of time underwater, including working as a stunt diver for adventure shows. Despite his outgoing personality, Kenny is also very methodical and is a licensed captain, emergency medical technician, and hyperbaric chamber operator. He is also skilled at both ocean diving and cave diving, which is a rare combination. Another member of the team, Jim Brown, is a highly experienced sump diver whose hearing impairment gives him an advantage underwater. He met Bill, the leader of the team, during a body recovery operation and became involved in Bill's rebreather development project. By the time the expedition began, he had logged more than 200 hours of dive time on the machine. Finally, we have Steve Portal, who is a property analyst from Minnesota. Steve was originally rejected from the team because of his lack of dry caving experience, but after two years of training, Bill was impressed and made him a full member of the team. The seven of them are joined by additional team members from Florida and Texas before heading to Mexico to explore the Huatla Cave. The team spent five weeks training at a location in Florida that mimics the conditions of the Huatla Cave, and several months later, they set off for the cave. Upon their arrival at the dive site, they set up base at Camp 5, and they spent some days rigging the cave with a rope as long as two miles, intending to reach the other end of the San Agustin sump a section of the cave that is difficult to pass through due to its depth and the presence of silt and stalactites. Bill made Noel, Steve, and Ian the main team. On March 23rd, they started their expedition with several dives in three days. They went individually to lay guidelines on the cave floor. They decided to do solo diving because they were trying to avoid any form of double fatality in case one got into trouble and the other was trying to help out. Ian was the initial person to dive. Ian met Noel on the dive platform before the dive, and the two of them carefully went through the exhaustive pre-dive checklist that Bill and Ian created. Following the completion of the checklist, Ian strapped a pair of fins over his pair of Wellington boots, slipped his mask over his face, put on his helmet, and plunged into the chilly water. 
There, Noel gave him a sizable yellow diving tank with an additional 105 cubic feet of breathing gas, which was one of the high-pressure composite fiberglass tanks created for the 1984 P. Colorado trip. For the tank to ride across his butt sideways, Ian attached it to two stainless D-rings fixed on his harness. If the rebreather completely failed, this big cylinder would serve as the main backup tank. Two plastic reels containing 394 feet of 3mm nylon parachute cord apiece were given to Ian by Noel. The most important tool for cave divers is the dive reel. If the diver gets lost, loses his lights, loses sight in a silt-out, runs out of air, or does all of the above, he can swiftly locate his way out of the cave by putting a line into it as he moves. Along the length of the rope, knots were tied every 10 feet to serve as measuring devices. Finally, Noel handed a backup decompression computer, two dive knives, a gap reel, a smaller reel with 98 feet of 1 mm wire, and many plastic slates for riding on while below. Ian lowered himself into the murky water by opening the dump valve on his buoyancy compensator. His quartz halogen light's handle was turned and a laser-like beam shot into the distance, illuminating the tunnel's walls. The parachute cord, whose end was fastened to the platform behind him, started to spool out freely once he turned the locking screw on the first reel. We can see what lies ahead now, he thought to himself. As he was slowly descending, he began carefully kicking his way into the tunnel. He kicked lightly, like a tadpole, keeping his knees bent to prevent his fins from disturbing the muck on the cave floor. He topped off his buoyancy compensator with a little more gas and added a few more meters to the bottom. Gas entered the urethane bladder in the form of a horseshoe and the inflator valve made a soothing pop sound. Similarly, he added a blast of gas to his dry suit by reaching over his chest. He redirected his focus back to the topography once he had reached neutral buoyancy where San Augustine's sump was neither heavier nor lighter than the water surrounding him. The length of the tunnel was roughly 16 feet long, with a width of 10 feet at the top and a narrower base. It had several stones strewn about and a bottom of gritty gravel. A layer of ochre silt covered the walls. The visibility was superb, and Ian's handheld main light had little trouble illuminating the entire area for at least 67 feet. He moved slowly down the right-hand wall, carefully using his light beam to scan the ceiling. He was looking for an air pocket that Bill might have missed because it was a shortcut up to the walking path. He paused to secure the dive line after spotting a jug hole, a natural loop naturally worn into the solid limestone. Near where he had stopped, there was a small natural alcove, so he figured there would be an excellent place to store the yellow rescue bottle. The fiberglass tank could be used as a decompression station, or in the unlikely scenario that both the rebreather and the backup open circuit system fail, a diver could take up the bottle and take it back out like a last chance gas supply. It was filled with pure oxygen. He aimed the large light back into the shadows and swam along the enticing beam's path. Since he had left the dive platform, the tunnel had been slowly lowering until it leveled off around 33 feet below the sump surface. As he moved ahead at a speed of roughly 67 feet per minute and through chilly, clear blue water, the knots on his dive line whirled off his reel. The same as smooth rock, the main area was smooth and textured. The reel abruptly seized, throwing him back. He grimaced as he cast a downward glance, expecting to see a broken reel. Unexpectedly, he discovered an empty spool. 394 feet of line had already been used up. He was moving forward quickly. The second reel was unclipped from his harness. The first line had a big loop at the end that made it possible to remove it from the initial spool. He tied a lark's head knot by threading the second reel through the loop at the end of the first line. He reattached the empty reel to his harness and started pulling in an additional line. He discovered a vertical shaft that descended into what looked to be a sizable breakdown chamber, about 459 feet from the dive platform. Another tunnel could be seen overhead, bending off to his right. Always hopeful, he finned upward. The tunnel climbed up and up. 
His light immediately returned to him after striking a shiny surface. He moved in the direction of the mirror before quickly entering a huge air pocket. He filled his buoyancy compensator with air and raised his head higher above the water. The 33 by 20 foot air filled container was filled to the brim with air. Air that was warm, humid, and breathable filled it. However, there were no tunnels above ground. What about below, he questioned. He reeled out his dive line over the air pocket, using a lead weight as an anchor, because there were no natural tie-offs to be seen. On the opposite side, he hoped to discover a continued underwater tunnel, as if the air pocket were a river's oxbow. But the ground rose swiftly, and he soon found himself knee-deep in mud. Not as well organized as the ascent had been the retreat. While wading through the air pocket, he kicked up a lot of dirt, and a thick cloud of ochre silt filled the water throughout the tunnel and into the main shaft. He was in complete darkness by the time he made it back to his main dive line. He tightened the rope at the intersection and started to make his way down the shaft toward the breakdown boulders he had previously noticed. However, the mud was so thick that he never noticed the boulders. He turned around after sliding down 40 feet without seeing anything. He reeled back into the junction, locked off the reel, and left it fixed in place for the next diver, but instead of leaving the spool dangling in the shaft. He explained to his teammates that he was unable to continue because he had kicked up silt as he stood back up. Noel was the next to dive. Until he discovered the second reel hanging on the wall above the shaft, Noel continued to follow Ian's line. At a depth of around 40 feet, he encountered stacked limestone blocks the size of big dining tables after picking up the reel and entering the breakdown chamber. After spending many years caving, he was confident that there would be an accessible channel at the base of the breakdown slope. Noel tied off the rope and began to sweep the room's perimeter from right to left. Because the visibility was less than two body lengths and is nowhere near sufficient to look across the enormous shaft, he tied it off when he got to the end of Ian's reel and continued the line back to the start of the sweep. He then fastened a new reel and began sweeping the left wall while moving around. He noticed what appeared to be a portion of Bill's trademark red 1981 line going through the breakdown during this second sweep. I'm done now. One of his fins became caught in the line he was laying as he turned to take a closer look. To untangle the line, he had to pause and take off the fin. He was still learning to balance the buoyancy of the rebreather's internal bladder against that of the dry suit. So as he struggled, he lost control of his buoyancy and disturbed the breakdown block's ankle-deep layer of silt. There was insufficient vision to carry out the sweep after the silt billowed into a cloud. He became stuck in a slough. He continued to hover, taking great caution with every movement. Reeled back in looked like a straightforward enough concept. The thin nylon line was similar to a rubber band, though. It was elongated in all directions and offered only a hazy sense of direction. Noel slowly reeled. He was aware that the line typically crossed one or more jagged limestone edges. If he tugged too hard, the rubber band would break, leaving him helpless to swim out of the cave. He calmed himself by meditating before slowly reeling the line back up through the cloud. He returned to Camp 5 after leaving in just 47 minutes. As Steve and Ian assisted Noel in getting out of the water, he was shivering. Steve started his exploration by going through a side tunnel on the right-hand wall close to where Ian had placed the bailout bottle, because Ian and Noel had left the main tunnel with such reduced visibility. But after just about 23 feet, the floor rose rapidly, and the passageway next to the ceiling was too small to accommodate the large Cis Lunar MK4 rebreather. He therefore continued past the point where Noel had turned around and down to the breakdown chamber, retracing Noel's initial sweep. However, even 40 minutes into his dive, clouds of silt were still descending from the area where Ian had agitated the muck above. He tightened the nut on the reel and left it on the breakdown, since he thought the only way forward was straight over a huge boulder. After spending 48 minutes in the sump, he went back to Camp 5. 
So far in their dive, they had managed to lay 750 feet of line in three days. Three additional dives had been done, but not a single fresh meter of dive line had been laid. They were hungry, exhausted, and still upset. Additionally, they desired a few days above the surface. Bill wanted them to still extend the length of that line further, and he became impatient with Jim, who was the second most experienced diver among them. He had been using the rebreather that Bill had invented, but at a point, he lost interest in the dive because of his perception of the dive site. All of them were getting anxious and afraid of the expenditure because of those pressures. However, Bill's passion to execute his plan made him not pay attention to the emotions and strengths of his team members. Noel was expecting something bad might happen during their exploration, but Bill happens to be a tough leader and would not pay attention to any of these things. Whenever there was a delay, he would not take it easy with them. He just wanted everything to go as they'd planned it, with no chances given for alterations. At this moment, the expedition's future was in jeopardy. But like Bill, Ian refused to use a back door. Ian didn't approve when Noel appealed for them to all take at least two days off and enjoy some sunshine. Somebody's got to keep the momentum going. If nobody else will do it, I bloody will. He was determined to descend again. While others kept working at the dive site, Noel and Steve took a break and headed to Hawatla. Incredibly, Kenny and Ian had become close. At 27 and 29 years old, respectively, they were the expedition's young adults. Both were perfectionists who employed sarcasm as a defense mechanism. So with just them left behind, Kenny began suiting up for his first dive. In the breakdown chamber that had confused Noel and Ian on their previous dives, Kenny slid into the sump and did follow the guideline for 748 feet. His years of crawling beside the moles had paid off at that point. He stayed deep, as Bill had suggested after going over Noel's survey notes, and drifted through the underwater labyrinth while illuminating various potential paths with his handheld light until his intuition guided him through a small hole and into a wide channel. He just touched the silky silt bottom with the tip of his fin after passing through the restriction, exerting just enough pressure to release a mouthful of sediment. He kept an eye on the direction that the tiny silt column was drifting. His suspicion was confirmed when a tiny river moved the fine silt off of the path that he had chosen. Along the likely path, he drew a line. He started to tremble before his reel ran out. The wetsuit was far easier to wear than the dry suit, but it also offered much less protection from the bone-chilling water, as it only kept the diver warm, not dry. Kenny returned to Camp 5 after tying off the rope. Ian had a pot of hot tea ready for him when he arrived. Ian followed suit and dived into the water. He then extended another 394 feet of guideline after finishing Kenny's line, tying in a new reel. The corridor kept ascending. It was around 23 feet broad and a canyon. The walls were firm, scalloped, and clearly defined. The oval-shaped gallery's bottom was covered with gritty sand and gravel, and the river ran through it without interruption. Ian started to get chilly by the time his reel ran out of line. After turning, he headed back to Camp 5. Then followed the dive, during which Kenny learned that the sump could lead to a different location. After tying a fresh reel onto Ian's line, he moved along the right wall and ceiling. A big surface that resembled mercury could be seen up ahead after less than 131 feet. His already trembling spine shivered with excitement upon seeing the surface. He propelled himself forward as far as he could before letting his knees fall into the damp sand. He knelt and raised his head and shoulders above the water. He removed the mouthpiece checked his gas levels, and turned off the rebreather before breathing in the warm, moist air above. It tasted lovely to breathe. He exclaimed, Woohoo! He turned on his handheld light as the booming sound continued to echo. The end of the vault-like cavern was just barely illuminated. The room had a high arch ceiling and measured around 328 feet long by 39 feet wide. 
Black water that seeped fluidly in all directions, like oil, coated the floor. Two sand reefs, which resembled silent islands in a hidden sea, were spread out across the center of the ominous black pond. Despite having explored many underwater tunnels, Kenny had never surfaced in a place that felt so foreign and remote. His eyes could make out the limestone, and he was aware that the room had boundaries. But his ears were trying to convince him that the Black Sea went on endlessly by repeatedly echoing around the hard rock space. He spent some time on his knees in wonder, acutely aware that nobody, nobody had ever been to this location before. He was jolted back into the present by a shudder, and he said the single word, awesome. He wasn't ready to remove the rebreather, and it was too heavy for him to stand up smoothly while wearing it. He then removed his mask and fins and crept along the first sandbar while squatting down. The gritty sand had ripples in it. He crept up the second sandbar, waded across the shallow water between the islands, and entered the deeper sea afterward. Underwater, he could make out another passageway that looked a lot like the one he'd just passed through on the opposite side of the enormous air pocket. If there was a dry exit, he wasn't so sure. While Kenny felt secure in his underwater instincts, Ian seemed to have a greater sixth sense when it came to identifying dry caves. Concerned about the rebreather's battery life, he decided to go back and give Ian a turn. Kenny grew enthusiastic about informing Ian as he swam back. He wanted to spread the word that they had successfully broken the sump together. Kenny repacked the rebreather while Ian dressed after another hot dinner. In the air pocket, Ian intended to come to the surface, try to detach the rig, and then go exploring on foot. If not, he would begin extending the underwater channel that Kenny had noticed on the opposite side of the air pocket. His trip might take longer than the typical 60 to 90 minutes due to the time he might spend in the air pocket. He pleaded with Kenny to relax. Don't call out to cavalry unless I've been gone for six hours, he instructed. During Ian's first few hours of diving, Kenny cleaned up the camp kitchen. After finishing, he turned on the tiny butane stove and made tea. He turned on the stove to reheat the tea because it had grown cold. After 30 minutes, he repeated the action. He reheated Ian's tea at least eight times over the following four hours, like a worried mother waiting for her son to get home. And each time the tiny burner was lit again, it felt even more dreadful. He refilled Ian's carbide lamp and left it on the lower platform at 10 p.m., exactly six hours after Ian had gone. He wrote the following in a yellow-covered caving notebook. Ian, 10 p.m. I chose the cavalry. Kenny. Kenny was worried when he didn't arrive and wondered what was taking so long. After four hours of waiting, Kenny started to install the pulley system as they had planned in case Ian's arrival was delayed. Kenny decided to enter the cave's entrance at 6 o'clock to save one of their team members. Kenny thought Ian might have gone down with hypoglycemia in the air bell since he was an insulin-dependent diabetic patient, but he usually gives more consciousness to his blood sugar levels. He thought Ian could have been waiting for help down in the cave, so he went inside the cave but returned to the surface alone around 11.30 p.m. He told other team members who were already sleeping that there was a need for them to rescue one of their mates. But Bill went against Kenny's idea that the team members were already exhausted from their various activities. They've been pushed beyond their limits with no rest earlier. Don, a team member who was also diabetic, agreed to Bill's idea and further explained that Ian would be okay with the candy bars he had with him, which would sustain him until the next morning. If peradventure he was trapped in the air bell, Bill believed he would not be in danger of hypothermia. So they all had their rest that night and rose early the next morning around 5 a.m. They started preparing their rebreathers and called other cave divers who camped very close to them to help them in the rescue operation. Noel and Steve had also returned to the site. The search dive was started by Kenny. He moved quickly in the sump while looking around quickly underwater. 28 minutes later, his head appeared through the looking glass and into the air pocket. 
He removed the mouthpiece, got down on his knees, and yelled, Ian. He waited still, but all he could hear was the never-ending echo of his own words. He turned off the oxygen and removed his helmet, mask, and hood before wailing once more. Ian, you here, mate? Kenny sat quietly in the sand, and this time, with his ears open, he listened attentively for any sound, expecting to hear a faint scraping or a distant reply. However, nothing was there. He turned on his bright handheld dive light and began looking for a sign of Ian's direction. Finding it wasn't difficult. Footprints could be seen ascending directly over the sandbar. Kenny waded into the shallow water next to the sandbar instead of following straight, which would have meant either taking off the rebreather or walking across the sand wearing the hefty equipment and backup gear. He proceeded in this manner up across the first sandbar, back into the shallows, and over the second bar. The far edge of the second sandbar softly descended into the bright blue water. He saw something on the bottom from the surface. He put his mask back on and swam across the surface for about 49 feet. Ten feet below, on the bottom, Ian lay still. In a desperate attempt to reach him and find his pal, Kenny jumped right in. However, he realized Ian was already dead the moment he gripped his rigid shoulder. Kenny was startled by Ian's apparent ease as he floated gently in the still water. There were no signs of such a battle in the sand surrounding Ian's body. He appeared calm, as though he had merely dozed off. Kenny chose to leave Ian's body alone. Instead, he kept to Ian's path while searching for hints. It turned around and returned to where Ian was lying in the open water, after running along the east wall at a shallow depth and into the unexplored passageway beyond. Why'd you turn back, he asked. You figured it out that this place was just an air pocket. You ran a line along the wall, systematically probing for a route deeper into the cave. And then you found it. So why turn back? He stood over Ian's body for some time. You knew something was wrong, didn't you? Kenny inquired as he looked at the lifeless body of his friend. Something that with all your diving experience, you couldn't solve underwater. What? But there was no answer. Bill also came to the scene of the accident and went into the water to recover his buddy's body. Some other friends, together with Kenny, all helped bring the body out. They checked Ian's equipment to know what went wrong with him. His rebreather was working perfectly well. They assumed he had blacked out from insulin shock and later drowned. They had varying thoughts as to whether to have Ian buried in the cave or bring his body to the surface. They considered the difficulties of pulling his body out of that dangerous cave, and if they left it behind in the cave, they would have issues with the Mexican authorities if they couldn't provide the body. After six days, they were able to successfully bring out Ian's body. They hauled it over the slabs, up vertical shafts, and through the layers of falling water. They all focused on successfully bringing out the body, forgetting that it was their friend in the bag. This they did to help them get away from their emotions, which could cause mistakes as they struggled out of the cave. It was concluded that Ian Rowland died of hypoglycemia, or something similar, since he was a diabetic who had not eaten for some time, combined with serious exercise and mental impairment. Ian was a cave diver who was always very careful. He had logged more than 60 hours on the rebreather they were using for the present expedition. They took his body to Oaxaca City for an autopsy. The results showed that an insulin-related blackout caused asphyxiation, but they never knew if his rebreather had an impact on that. His team members mourned the loss of a great friend and fellow diver. The last shred of optimism the team members had for continuing the mission was destroyed by Ian's passing. But regardless of what happened, Bill was not going to abandon his long-held goal. He had waited 13 years to enter that chasm. Ian had provided a compass. It was just up to him to do the task. Bill made two unsuccessful attempts to enter the sump before taking it easy on his third attempt. He swam gently and kept a close ear out for leaks. This was because while bubbles were signs that indicated life for an open-circuit diver, they mean trouble on a rebreather. Every 100 feet, 
he clipped white plastic marker arrows with a corresponding number onto the dive line. He also checked the oxygen and heliox stage bottles, whose rubber handles had already become slippery from silt. He descended the breakdown shaft, finned through the opening at 78 feet, and within 30 minutes he arrived at what he had come to refer to as the Roland Air Pocket. He breathed deeply as he moved around with the 140 pounds of equipment on his back, and he carefully made his way around the right side of the air bell. His breath continually resonated through the still air pocket, becoming scary and making it seem as though another mouth-breathing creature was also present in the deep with him. On the last sandbar, he saw Ian's Wellingtons waiting to guide him through the second sump, standing exactly where he'd left them. He moved on into sump two and turned left into an open, watery corridor. He observed another tunnel much further back to his left as he paused to knot off the rope. He understood that this had to be the main passage. The Roland air pocket had little flow through it and resembled an oxbow, an abandoned bend in the underground river. He quietly swam into the main path, which immediately opened up. Although the silt prevented him from seeing the bottom, he was afraid the wide route might go quite deep. To his great delight, the ceiling leveled off at just eight and a half meters deep, so he hugged it. The line on Ian's reel went out after around 279 feet. He connected a second spool and continued traveling south. About midway through the following reel, he knew he was going to surface as the tunnel started to ascend. A little more than 558 feet past the Roland air pocket, he noticed the recognizable mirrored surface. He climbed up on a broad gravel beach that was at least 20 meters wide. He listened while removing the hood from his wetsuit. This wasn't just an air pocket. It was an open corridor, as evidenced by the audible sound of a waterfall in the distance. He continued to feel the strain from the rebreather's weight on his back and sighed to himself, Oh geez, finally we succeeded. He did a turtle-like turnover on the gravel bank before starting to detach the rig. When he was free of it, he got to his feet and used his electric light to scan the large cavern. Finally, he exclaimed. Finally, he said. Finally, he shouted. Finally, he screamed as the word echoed back to him. We finally cracked this mother. He lit a small carbide lamp before starting to climb up the gravel slope. Even though it was difficult to see, he made his way to a canyon and followed the river until it went into a sump that was so enormous it appeared to be an underground lake. He saw a doorway above the lake and ascended to it. He discovered a three-meter wide, clean scoured tunnel there and followed it for approximately 328 feet before coming to a 20-foot deep, steep pothole. He started to descend, but stopped himself. If it were anyone else, I'd tell them not to continue without vertical gear and a belay, he thought. Maybe just once I should heed my advice. Turning around, he made his way back to the rig, ready to tell Barb and the others what he had seen. He wasn't sure, but hoped that his discovery would be amazing enough to convince them to continue the expedition. He paused and against all the rules of modern caving ethics, did something he ordinarily wouldn't have done. Bill Stone, April 8, 1994, was scrawled on the wall using the carbide flame as a smudge. It had been a journey filled with highs, lows, tears, and years of sacrifice. Despite the tragic loss of Ian, their effort finally led to the cracking of the sump. A long-time vision had been accomplished over a decade later, Truly, it takes only a courageous and focused person to achieve a great feat. We would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.